So the title of my sermon this morning is Beware of Works Salvation. Beware of Works Salvation. We're going to go through a few ways where people, the way they preach the gospel, the wording that they use inadvertently or maybe intentionally or unintentionally is preaching a work salvation. And some of these you might have heard of. Now the Bible says in Psalm 119, 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. So you ask me, you ask Vic, did you hate work salvation? Yes, I hate work salvation because not only is it false, and I need to hate every false way, but if somebody believes in work salvation, they're going to go to hell. So preachers that are preaching work salvation are sending people to hell. It's something we ought to have a strong hatred for. Now, what is work salvation? When I talk about work salvation, work salvation, what is works? Works is when we keep the law. And we can see here in Galatians 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So when we're talking about work salvation, we're talking about somebody that is seeking to be justified before God or seeking to earn a place in heaven, earn the grace of God by doing a work, keeping a commandment of God. And this is why it's called the works of the law. But So we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but how? But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So work salvation is what people believe. They require works in order to be saved from hell. Now don't get mixed up with works and doing something. Because some people say like, well, you need to call upon the Lord to be saved. You need to believe. So they're like, you don't have to do nothing to be saved. You've got to do something. Yeah, but calling upon the Lord, you know, in faith is not works, right? That's not works. Like if I ask somebody to do something for me, how am I doing works, right? So when we talk about works, we're talking about you having to obey God, you having to keep the commandments in order to go to heaven. Yes, you must do something, to go to heaven, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And once you have your faith in Jesus Christ, it's done. So, it's how, it's eternally saved. Once saved, always saved. But, you know, you need to make sure you've done that. right? But if you think you need to do something on top of that, or you need to do something in order to receive that grace, that is what is work salvation. So Ephesians 2 says here, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Why is it, why is it a gift? Because it's by grace. See, like a gift, we were teaching this in Kids Club two weeks ago. Hey, a gift is something you don't pay for. Right? You have to work for a gift. It's not a gift. Right? Who pays for the gift? The giver or the receiver? The giver pays for the gift. That's why Jesus paid for the gift. What does the receiver need to do? Does the receiver now need to work for the gift? No, the, all the receiver has to do is just receive the gift. It's a free gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we're saved. Grace is something that you're given. You're saved through faith. How do you receive this grace? It's through faith. Right? We don't receive it through works. So this is what works salvation is. Work salvation is by works you're saved. Or sometimes work salvation comes a little bit wrapped up nicer. It's for by grace are you saved through works. <laughs> right? So it's like you earn the grace by works. And this is what you see in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, right? Where they say, you're saved by grace, but in order to get this grace, you need to get baptized, you need to take communion, you need to keep so these are these are the ordinances that you need to do in order to receive this grace. That's not that's not a gift. You know, you need to do things in order to receive this, keep commandments. That's not a gift. A gift is you call upon the Lord, you ask for it, you receive it. So by grace, and why is it by faith? Because we don't actually see it, right? We believe it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, so if putting your faith on Jesus Christ to receive this gift was works, it wouldn't make sense to say by grace that you say through faith, and they're not of works. Because if it was a work, it wouldn't say that that's not of works. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, when I sometimes talk about eternal security, once saved, always saved, 
salvation by grace, usually two objections come up when you talk to people about them. One is, somebody might say, well, you don't think people should strive to do good works? Well, of course, you know, we, people should strive to do good works. I mean, would anyone look at my life and think, Victor doesn't believe you should strive to do good works? I mean, if I didn't believe you strive to do good works, I mean, I wouldn't be here, right? So obviously I believe in striving for good works, but see, I, how can I have the belief that salvation is not of works and yet believe that I, you still have to do good works because these two things are separate things, right? Separate. What I'm saved by is Jesus Christ. What God expects from me as a believer is works. So it's a, different, it's a different reason for why I do it now. And the Bible says here in Ephesians 2, like people always accuse me of saying, oh, you know, you're not quoting verse 10. You're not quoting verse 10. I'm not scared of verse 10, right? Verse 8 and 9 is saying you're saved by grace, not of works. But all verse 10 is saying the reason why God saved you is to do good works. Now, do I have a problem with that? No. Yeah, that's why God saved you. Why does God have you on this earth? It's to do good works. And this is why it says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship. So it's like, why has God saved us? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Should you walk in the good works that God has before ordained for you, before you got saved? Yes, you should. But do you need to do them to be saved? Now, there's a lot of things you should do in the Christian life. You should go to church. You should read your Bible. You should help others. You should obey the commandments. But what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's Acts 16. Right? So, yeah, you should do it. Sure. I don't have a problem with that. So, people say, well, you don't think people should strive to do good works. No, no, no. I, I do think people should do good, good works. And for those of you who have sat in my preaching, I talk about it a lot. Right? Um... Or somebody would say, um, why would somebody do good works if they're saved either way? Right? Somebody would say, like, well, if I'm guaranteed heaven, and no matter what I do, I'm going to heaven anyway, they'll say, well, what's the point of doing a good work? What's the point? Well, that, that would be like saying, well, if my son's my son anyway, why do I need to love him? I you know, just abuse him, just neglect him, kick him out of my house. There's no point. He's my son anyway. I mean, can you see how, you know, we're just saying one reason why you keep works is not to get to heaven. So Jesus dying on the cross, removing the curse from you, removes the, that reason to do good works. Now, if we didn't have a saviour, that would be a reason. Right? But it's impossible. That's the problem. But if we didn't have a saviour, striving to do good works to get to heaven, we'd all be you know, chasing this carrot that is unattainable. And this is why God gave it to us. But there are other reasons for why we do good works. Just like there are other reasons to love your wife even though you're always married to her. Other reasons to love your children even though they're always your children. You know, you want a good relationship. You know, you want to, especially when it comes to good works in the world, you know, you want to make a difference in this world. You want to love your neighbor. You don't want to like bring, you know, problems into people's lives. You want to earn rewards in heaven. You want to invest your time for the eternity rather than the temporal. So plenty of reasons. But what we're talking about today is we're talking about subtle ways that this teaching of work salvation creeps back into people's lives. And sometimes they don't realize it. And this is what I want to talk about today. 2 Corinthians 11, this is the same verse I talked about with the kids' class today, who happened to be at Corinthians. It says here in 2 Corinthians 11, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So how did uh, we go back to Genesis? How did Eve get corrupted? Who, the kids, the kids, you guys remember? I hope you guys don't make me look bad in this one. Do you remember? What, was, what did Satan do to... to uh, what was the question I asked this morning? What did Satan do to Eve? Do you remember? Question, question God's word. Very good. And what did, what did Eve do? What, what did Eve not do? Who remembers, Ryan? Eve, yeah? Well, she didn't know God's word, did she? And that's why she disobeyed. And then what did Satan do at the end, Simon? He denied God's word. And he denied God's word. So you see how Satan started questioning God's word? Suppose he questioned God's word? Eve didn't know God's word because she said, no, I can't eat it, but I also can't touch it. So she didn't know God's word well enough. And then you can imagine that when she touched the fruit, I oh, didn't die. Right, but that wasn't the command. The command is you shouldn't eat it in the day you eat thereof. You shall surely die. And then that's when Satan just blatantly denied God's word and said, you shall not surely die. Right? So that's what we learned about in kids' club this, this morning. I'm glad your kids were listening. It's good. 
So that's how you're going to get beguiled by Satan, by work salvation, is if you do not know salvation correctly, you do not know the Bible very well, you don't know why you believe what you believe, that's when you are in danger of being beguiled, deceived through the subtlety of Satan, right? Through the sneakiness. Verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What he's saying? See, like if you do not know and you are deceived, you may, be, you may end up accepting false doctrine. You may be accepting something false. You may be accepting a teaching of a wrong Jesus. Or you may be accepting like another spirit, like something that's not in the Word of God. Right? Like a teaching that is wrong. Or another gospel. And this is the one I'm focusing on today. Is you don't want to be tripped up into believing a works salvation gospel as opposed to salvation by grace. You know, because so, salvation is simple. Salvation is, you know, we're sinners, we deserve hell, Jesus died for our sins. We, but we trust and believe, we call upon the Lord to trust what he did for us. And in that moment, we're saved forever. And you might say, well, Victor, if salvation is so simple, why do we need to preach on it all the time? Why is it so complicated? Because when people try and attack salvation, you know, believing salvation is very simple. The concept is very simple. Defending it is where it starts to get more complex, right? Because there can be a lot of ways, there's a lot of fiery darts from the wicked. And even if you say, well, you know, salvation, you, you, you got the death, is it, you know, the physical death, you got the spiritual death, you got the blood, you got the burial, then you got the resurrection, got all these things. Yeah, there is a lot to salvation. But what I'm saying is the concept is simple. Just like, you know, a car. You know that a car gets you from A to B. You don't necessarily need to know every, everything, you know, like the mechanic I bring the car to, he knows all the inner workings of the car. But does that mean you can't know what the purpose of a car is and how to drive a car? So that's what I mean by salvation is simple. It's a very simple concept. But it's under attack because people, you know, want to preach another gospel. People want to get people back into bondage. They want to get people back into keeping the commandments in order to get to heaven and some people intentionally, some people well-intentioned, but, you know, unintentionally, in the sense that they, they think that if they promote a works salvation, that's going to make people change, that's going to keep people on the right path. Well, you know what? I'd rather keep somebody on the path going to heaven and be saved rather than get them on the wrong path but change their life and then they end up dying and going to hell because they're trusting their works as opposed to trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. So I've got seven examples I just want to go through of subtle ways that work salvation can creep back in. Now the first one is you might hear people say something like, yeah, yeah, Jesus died for me, Jesus died for my sins, but I've got to do my part to get to heaven. Now, obviously I believe we do works in order to obey God, right, in order to live the Christian life, like I said before. I'm all for good works. What I'm talking about here is not doing your part in terms of in, in the grand scheme of Christianity and a Christian should do good works. What I'm saying is there are people that believe Jesus gets you 90% of the way, 95% of the way, but I've got to do my part in order to make it 100% of the way. Right? This is what they mean by, but you need to do your part. Now why is this wrong? Because we are either saved by grace or works. Remember in Ephesians 2, by grace you're saved, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now what you have to understand is, you can't have a combination of works and grace. Once you have a combination of works and grace, it's not, it's not grace anymore. Just like if I said to you, I'm going to give you a gift, and even if I didn't charge you the whole amount, let's say I paid $100 for the gift, and I said, you only need to give me a dollar for it. That's not a gift. right? The moment you have to pay for it, you have to do a work for it, it's not a gift anymore. And this is why the Bible is very clear. You cannot mix grace and works. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. 
So you can understand that concept when it comes to something that is free or not. If it costs you even 10 cents, it's not free. So it's the same with the gift of God. It's, all either, it's either all Jesus or it's all you. Right? Those are your, those are your two options. There is no option of 90% Jesus, 99% Jesus, and 1% you. Because the moment you have 1% you, it all works. Now look here in Galatians 5 verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So he's specifically talking about salvation here. Because what was happening in the Galatian church? In the Galatian church, there were people creeping into the Galatian church these Judaizers, right? Teaching people, teaching the Gentiles there as well, that they had to be circumcised to be saved. So this is the context of what Paul is saying here when he's referring to circumcision. Because people were believing in order to be saved, they had to be circumcised. They had to keep that commandment. Now verse 2, Paul says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, so these are the people that believe they had to be circumcised to be saved, Christ shall profit you nothing. You say, well, why won't Christ profit me 95%? Why won't Christ profit me 99%? I'm just doing 1%. No, he says, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why? For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Look at this. That he is a debtor to do the whole law. So you see, if you think you have to do one commandment to get to heaven, what well, the Bible's saying here, well, then you're going to have to do it all. It's all on you, buddy. Right? It's all on you. Because if you have to do one commandment to get to heaven, then you're on your own. But if you turn from dead works, trusting in dead works, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's your way out. That's your say, salvation. But it's got to be 100% on Jesus. Christ, verse 4, is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Right? You have not obtained this grace that uh, Jesus Christ offers to you. So, you need to do your part. There's a subtle way that sort of work salvation creeps into it. Yeah, do you need to do works as a believer to, to be a good believer, to be a good Christian, an obedient son or obedient daughter? Of course. But, even if you're, what you need to understand is even if you're a disobedient son, even if you're a disobedient daughter, you're still saved because that's how grace works. You're just a disobedient son. Just like our children are disobedient, but they're still our children. Here's another one. Number two, maybe you've heard this a lot. You know, you've gone to other churches or, you know, you've heard people preach the gospel. You may have heard these things. These are very common things that people say. But nonetheless, they are a way, they are a work salvation, the way they are said. Number two is you may go to a church and there's like an altar call. I don't do altar calls here, but there's altar calls. And they they'll say, now's the time. Give your life to Jesus. Come and give your life to Jesus. Now, if they mean it in the context of, you know, as a believer, sort of dedicating, saying, you know what, I'm going to rededicate my life and start serving God again. It's not about my salvation. I just got off the wrong way. I'm trying to get back on and, you know, do what I should be doing. You know, like a prodigal son coming home. But oftentimes this phrase is used as a call to salvation. Right? Come to be saved. Give your life to Jesus. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem with this is this message, this call to salvation, is in fact the opposite of the call to salvation, or the opposite of what the gospel is. Because what is the gospel? The gospel is not you giving your life to Jesus. right? The gospel is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So notice salvation is the opposite of giving your life to Jesus. Salvation is Jesus giving his life for you. You're receiving the life that he gave up in order to save you. Now the Christian life is giving your life to Jesus. right? But the Christian life is striving to keep the commandments. So if we have to live the Christian life to be saved, that's the very definition of work salvation. So we don't. Do that in order to be saved. We do it in response to being saved if our heart is right with God. So we don't give our life to Jesus. Jesus gave his life for us. Matthew 20, 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Minister means to serve. And to give his life 
a ransom for many. Galatians 1, 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you need to do your part? No, to be saved. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to give your life to Jesus? No, Jesus gave his life for you. You just need to accept the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Free gift. And once you receive that, you receive eternal life. You're eternally saved. Number three. Number three. You might hear this one. You might hear somebody say, you not only need to make Jesus your saviour, but you also need to make him your Lord. Right? They'll say, like, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Now, as a believer, say believer, trying to live right, amen and amen. Right? All good. You know, work, works, works is like one of those things where if it's before salvation, it's disgusting. Right? It's filthy ranks. So it's after salvation, it's a beautiful thing. I often say it's like marriage, you know, like a couple kissing and hugging and everything before marriage, that's, a, that's an unclean thing in God's eyes. An unclean thing. But after marriage, it's a beautiful thing. It's a bit like that with works, you know. Baptism to be saved is disgusting. Baptism because you're saved, that's beautiful. Making Jesus the Lord of your life before you're saved to get salvation is wrong. Making Jesus the Lord of your life once you're saved, that's, that's great. That's a beautiful thing. So what does it mean to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Because, see, we differentiate and we say, no, you, you're saved when Jesus is your saviour. Making Jesus your saviour, meaning you believe on him. You're trusting him. He's the one that's saving you. But what does it mean to make somebody your Lord? So this is what we're going to talk about. Making Jesus the Lord of your life. When you make somebody your Lord, that's when you're willing to obey them. You're willing to follow their commandments. You're making them your Lord. Now somebody might say this something like this when they have this sort of mentality. Right? They have this thinking. You're going to make Jesus not only your saviour. Now some people will say, they'll just say it because, you know, Christianity has a lot of phrases, right? So they'll just say, I made Jesus my Lord and my Saviour. But what they just mean by that is, I trusted Christ as my Saviour. If that's what they mean, that's fine. But there are preachers out there that make it a point that it's, no, it's not just your Saviour, He's also your Lord. And what they mean by that is, it's not just good enough to trust Him for salvation, you've got to be willing to follow Him. You've got to be willing to obey Him. You've got to keep the commandments. You know, and then... Maybe you'll be saved, you know? So they might say something like this. I heard this said before. I don't know if you've heard this said before. They'll say, if he's not Lord of all, which means if he's not Lord in every area of your life, then they'll say he's not Lord at all. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, this, this statement, that would require perfection. Right? So... Just thinking about this passage, I mean, this passage, not passage, this quote, I mean, if somebody was to say this, I mean, are they not teaching that you have to be perfect in order to, to be saved? If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So what they're saying is, if he's not Lord all your life, then he's not your Lord at all, meaning you're not saved. Now, there's a problem with that. Why? Because the Bible says here in John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, look at this, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So when you sin, who is your Lord? Sin is your Lord, right? Because when you sin, you're the servant of sin. So that would mean, if this is true, you would have to not sin at all. Because that means Jesus is not Lord of all. Because if you're sinning, there's areas where he's not Lord. Because when you sin, you're Lord, right? You're serving yourself. You're serving the flesh. You're serving sin. Romans 6, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you see, you'd have to be perfect if you couldn't sin to make Jesus your Lord in order to be saved this way. We're not saved this way, thank God. We're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus here. Luke 6, 46. He says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say. So you see, if you just make Jesus your Lord, but you're not actually obeying him, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? So people can make Jesus their Lord all their life, all they like, but if they're not obeying, so you see how this is a teaching, you need to obey to make Jesus the Lord of your life 
in order to be saved, is teaching a work salvation. Because when you make Jesus your Lord, you've got to do the things which he says. You've got to keep his commandments. Now what's funny about this, like here in Matthew 7, let's read it first and then uh, we'll talk about it. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Remember here? Why call you me Lord, Lord? Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now here are people, it seems, on the outward anyway, that made Jesus their Lord. <laughs> so they made Jesus their Lord. I mean, they are prophesying in Jesus' name, thy name cast out in thy name. There are many, many wonderful works. Not just some wonderful, a few wonderful works. Many wonderful works. But why did Jesus say, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity? Because they didn't actually believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't actually trust. Because what is the will of God? This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now this passage here is often used to scare people into a works salvation mentality, right? Because people will say, oh, you know, you, this is like the most fearful words you will hear. I never knew you. You know, are you ready? Are you living right? And things like that. Now, your fear should not be based on whether or not you are living right, that Jesus might say these words to you. Your fear should be based on, are you actually believing on the Lord Jesus? Have you actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, the person that should be fearful of this is the person that is striving to get their way to heaven by works, but yet that is what they are trusting, like these guys, to get them into heaven. Have I not only done all these many wonderful works? This is the person that should fear hearing these words. But you ask, Victor, do you fear hearing these words? No, I won't hear these words because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows me, right? He says, I'm one of his sheep. He knows me. He's not going to say, I never knew you, right? Because he knows me because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I have his righteousness. If he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I mean, the only iniquity that I would have, if I did have iniquity, when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, would be his iniquity. But he doesn't have any, right? Because I've got his righteousness. When I shed my flesh, there is no more iniquity, right? So this is talking about unsaved people coming to Jesus and trusting their works. This is not talking about people who do believe on Jesus Christ and yet just have not given their life to Jesus and you know, have not made Jesus the Lord of their life. So... Here is people that made Jesus the Lord of their life. And yet, why did they not go to heaven? Because they not see the Son and believe on him and have everlasting life and they will be raised up at the last day. So that's make Jesus the Lord of your life. Number four, what's another one? When people say sin can cause you to lose salvation. Sin can cause you to lose salvation. Now, salvation is once you're saved, you're always saved. And like I said at the beginning of this sermon, a lot of people here, once saved, always saved, and they think that means you think people can live however they want. No, I do not believe people can live however they want. What I do believe is even if somebody did the wrong thing and lived however they want, they would still go to heaven. That's eternal security. But should they live however they want? No, like Ephesians 2.10 says, the works that God has before ordained, they should walk in them. Right? So they shouldn't live that way. They should live a holy life. But people teach, some people teach that if you sin enough, you can sin salvation away. You can lose your salvation in one way or another. But no, because when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all sins. There's no sin that you can commit that Jesus hasn't paid for. So if you say, I can sin my salvation away, well, what sin can I commit that Jesus didn't already pay for? Because every sin I commit in the future is paid for. So what sin am I going to do that's going to make me lose salvation? It's not possible. And not only that, Jesus promises us eternal life. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father 
are one. So you see, when you're saved, you're in Jesus' hand. You're in the Father's hand because Jesus and the Father are the same person, right? So you're in Jesus' hand, you're in the Father's hand, so no man can pluck you out of their hand. Why? Because you're a man too, right? So you can't even pluck yourself out of the Father's hand, out of Jesus' hand. So sin cannot cause you to lose salvation because if you had to live a certain way in order to maintain salvation, think about this. How is that any different to earning salvation? Because somebody that believes you can lose your salvation, unless they believe it takes works to gain salvation, ultimately they're going to come back to gaining salvation by works. Why? Because think about this. If I gain salvation by grace, because I didn't have to do anything to gain, I gained it, but then I lose it by sinning. So then, how do I get it back again? I'm going to get it back by grace, right? So, <laughs> is it just like a constantly, like, you know, it's like a, an endless loop, like you guys do programming, it's just like constantly, do, 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 like give, take, take, give, take, give. As soon as I give it, I get it back by grace. I lose it, I get it back by grace. Get it. So, is it like that? No. So, ultimately, isn't it the same thing? If I'm saying I don't earn, I have to earn salvation by works, but if I lose it, and then I got to keep it to not lose, if I got to do works, to stop myself from losing it, am I not the, is that not the same as doing works in order to gain it? Because we're going to lose it by not doing works, and I'm just going to gain it by gracing it. Right? So really what I'm doing is I'm doing works in order to keep it. So that doesn't make sense. Now, somebody might say, or you can see how you can lose your salvation. It's a form of work salvation. Now somebody might say, well, you don't lose salvation by committing a sin, but if you, if you stop believing, then that's you giving the gift away. You don't want the gift anymore, so then you can, you can give salvation away, which is, which is not true because that would be you plucking yourself out of Jesus' hand. So no, even if you desire to walk out of the hand, it's too late, right? Because the Father is not, not going to leave you nor forsake you. But look at what it says here. Oh, this is what uh, the passage I was referring to. See, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But look in 2 Timothy 2. You say, well, maybe not if I sin, but if I stop believing, will I still be saved? Well, look at what it says here in 2 Timothy 2. And I explain it to you with verse 12, because I don't want you to get tripped up by verse 12. Because sometimes when you show somebody this verse, they say like, oh, but what do we do? Verse 12, it says if we deny him, he's going to deny us, right? So if you don't make a public stand for Jesus and you're, you know, you know obeying his commandments, then he's going to deny you salvation. Well, that's not true. It's not telling you here what is being denied, right? But what we get the principle here is, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So how do you understand 2 Timothy 2? 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 is saying, if we, suffer, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Right? So these are the two passages that go together. Because if you were willing to suffer with Jesus Christ, you are given rewards on the day of judgment. So what is it saying here? If we deny him rather than suffer with him, he also will deny us. What is this? Reign, authority, rewards. But notice who is getting denied here. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, so it's a good work, obviously, to take a stand for Jesus Christ, but if you don't, then we deny him, he also will deny us. So who's getting denied? It's our request, isn't it? But, verse 13, it says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Look at this. He cannot deny himself. So you see, salvation is not a promise that you have made. Salvation is a promise that God has made to you. So this is why even if you do not believe, if you stop believing for whatever reason, but you've already received eternal life, God doesn't become a liar. Because why? He cannot deny himself. He has spoken and cannot turn back. Right? He's giving you eternal life. Whereas this, this is based on your works. Right? Your works in terms of how much rewards you will get in heaven, you may be denied rewards because of your works. Right? So that's sin causing you to lose salvation. Another subtle way people start thinking salvation by works. Number five is when people say you must have a saving faith. A saving faith. And what they really mean by this. See, a saving faith, the right way to understand a saving faith, 
is a saving faith is a faith that's on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a faith that doesn't save is a faith that's in yourself, a faith that's in a false religion, a faith that's in good works, a faith that's in something other than Jesus Christ. A saving faith is faith that is on the Lord Jesus Christ. But people try and use James 2 to teach that a saving faith is a faith that also have, has works. Right? So what they're basically saying is if you don't have works, you're not saved. They've just tried to mix it in with faith. So we need to understand James 2, and we'll just compare this with Romans 4. We'll go through it quickly. It's not an in-depth sermon. But this is where they get it from. They say, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And they'll say, what that means is you're not actually saved. You don't have this saving faith because it doesn't have works. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that your faith is dead. But you can have a living faith and you can have a dead faith. But you can have a saving faith and an unsaving faith, right? Like an un a faith that doesn't save is one that's not on Jesus. A saving faith is one on Jesus. But you can also have a living faith, which is faith when you add works to your faith. But you can also have a dead faith. Somebody who's saved and has a dead faith is somebody that doesn't have works. And there are plenty of people like that in the world where they believe on Jesus Christ, but what are they doing for God? Nothing. That's somebody with a dead faith. Does that mean they can't be saved? No, because salvation is by grace. They can receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. They're saved, they're just not being obedient. They're just going to have nothing when they get to heaven. You know, they're gonna, their, their foundation is going to be burned. Jesus will be there, they'll be saved, but they'll suffer loss, yet so as by fire. Verse 21, this is the key to de debunking James 2. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, can the Bible be teaching works salvation? No. We need to understand what's going on here. This is talking about justification in the eyes of men. Like we see Abraham's faith because he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. We understand now that Abraham believed that God was able to raise up Isaac from the dead. So this is why in verse 22 it says, Seest thou, you see how faith wrought with his works and by faith was uh, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and was called the friend of God. Ye see then, so again, ye see, you see, right? Because this is us as man seeing another man's faith, because we don't see it by what they believe, we see by what they do. Then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So what's the key here? The key here is James 2, is talking about your faith in the eyes of men, but when it comes to your faith in the eyes of God, look at what Romans 4 says. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, so this is talking about before God, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was, in, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So you see, so if you have to work for salvation, notice, remember Ephesians 2? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So this is reinforcing this. This is saying now, if you work for salvation, it's something you get, a reward that's not reckoned of grace, right? But of debt. What does that mean? It means it's owed to you. But to him that worketh not, no works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. What does it mean to impute? Like put to your account without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? He said, how did Abraham get this righteousness? By faith? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So we're told here that the righteousness of faith that saved Abraham was given to him prior to even being circumcised. So this is how we can know, we can prove that James 2 is not talking about Abraham's salvation. 
It's talking about him being justified in the eyes of men in terms of adding works to his faith because before God he was justified and received the imputed righteousness even before he received the sign of circumcision. So if you know the timeline, he received the sign of circumcision, then he had Ishmael, then he had Isaac, and then Isaac was offered on the altar. And he, you wonder why Abraham was willing to kill Isaac on the altar? Because he believed that God was going to raise Isaac up. He understood that God was going to send a saviour who was going to die and rise again. So he thought that Isaac was playing that out. So he knew that if he died, he killed Isaac, Isaac would be risen again from the dead. But what he didn't realise when he went to kill his son is that God would then provide a ram as a substitute and he didn't have to go through with that sacrifice. But that's why, you wonder why, you know, is Abraham just some crazy man? Is this willing to kill us? No, I think he, he believed that God um, was testing him um, the faith that he knew that God would raise his son up again from the dead. Number six, so two more. Number six is, and you hear this all the time, this is just like rampant throughout Christianity and throughout all the churches you go to, they say, in order to be saved, and I'm, remember, I'm talking, all these things I'm talking about here is in order to be saved. That's what I'm talking about. I don't have a problem with these things if it's Christians must do these. If this was a sermon, this would make a good sermon on what Christians should do. <laughs> and I just go through the same seven points and these are things you should do as a Christian. But what I'm talking about is these are not things that must be done in order to be saved. And if somebody believes these are things that they have to do to be saved, they risk not actually being saved. Right? Because salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Number six is you must repent of your sins. Now where it gets tricky is a lot of people say this phrase, just like they say, make Jesus Lord of your life, which is a work salvation phrase. But what they mean by it may not mean be work salvation. So if they say, I made Jesus my Lord and my Saviour, but they just mean, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what they mean, what they believe is right. What they're saying is wrong. So we need to line up what we're saying to be right with what we actually believe. It's the same with this. Some people say you must repent of your sins, but all they mean by that is you need to acknowledge you're a sinner and know that your sins are deserving of hell. I agree with that. You do need to know that you're a sinner and know that you deserve hell. But what, what it means to repent of sins, it means to stop sinning. That's what to return from your sins means. When you turn from your sin is that you were sinning and now you stop sinning. Now what is sin? 1 John 3, we have a definition here in the Bible. Well, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is, trans, is the transgression of the law. Now what a sin is, a sin is when you break a commandment. That's what a sin is. So when somebody says you need to repent of sin in order to be saved, the opposite of breaking a commandment is keeping a commandment. That's the opposite. Now if I just said to you, you need to keep the commandments to be saved, you would say, heretic, get out of here, you know, heresy. But if I say you need to repent of your sins to be saved, oh, you know, now we're using Bible terminology, right? <laughs> so, but all they're saying, oh, that, that phrase is saying the same thing in a different way. You know, because I said you have to keep the commandments. If I say you have to stop sinning to be saved, that's work salvation. This is what this is saying. You need to turn from sin. Stop sinning. So this is work salvation when they say you need to repent of your sins. Now, that's why the confusing thing is a lot of people just use this term, not understanding, not really thinking about what this phrase is implying to people, because they think the Bible talks about repentance. Yeah, the Bible does talk about repentance. Repentance means a change. But for salvation, it's not a change of your works. Salvation is a change of your faith from dead works, right? Dead works is not sin. Dead works is good works that you're trusting to get you to heaven. When you turn from dead works, you're saying, I'm no longer going to trust my good works and I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the repentance for salvation. Now, the repentance for a believer is repentance from sins. Daily, in your life, taking up the cross, following Jesus, the daily pursuit, it's an up and down and you want it to trend upwards. But this is the daily struggle. And nothing that you daily struggle with is what is required for salvation. Because salvation is a one-time event. You're born again. So that's what it means to sin. 
And we can see here in Ezekiel 18, the opposites here. The opposite of turning from, away from sin and doing righteousness. Because these are the same thing, two different sides of the coin. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. So notice here, when we're in the Old Testament now, right? Where the old, in the Old Testament, work salvation was preached. Not that, not that they were saved by work salvation, so that you can, you can go to... Pass, that's why, this is the tough thing about work salvation. Because if you want a passage to believe work salvation, they're there. Why? Because the Old Covenant, which is the covenant we could not keep, is, is taught to show that we could not keep this. Right? That's why God said to Moses, Behold this day I set before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord. A cursing if you won't. Because that's the old covenant that condemns us. We cannot keep. And this is why we need the covenant of grace to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because we cannot do this. But I'm just showing you here the difference, right? You can turn away not only from sin, you can turn away from righteousness. What happens when you turn away from righteousness? You commit iniquity. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive because he considered, considereth, turneth away from all his transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live. So how do we turn away from our transgressions in the New Testament? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or even in the Old Testament. This is how they turned away because this is how they got the imputed righteousness. Yet say the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. Or house of Israel... Are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. So the person that is teaching, repent of your sins to be saved. These are the sort of verses they'll go to. This is why I'll say, you know, if you want a verse to teach work salvation, they're there. Here's one of them. Right? But the thing is, this is how you show it's impossible. Because most people are humble enough when they say you need to repent of your sins. They'll say like, yeah, well, you don't have to be perfect. So what they mean is, well, you just have to go halfway? That's not what this verse says. This verse says, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So you see here, work salvation requires perfection. And this is why it's impossible. This is, this is not just saying you just have to be willing to turn from your sins. You, know, you just have to have the desire but not actually doing it. This is you actually have to do it for all your iniquities. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So, see how it's work salvation. Look here, Jonah 3 is where the Bible clearly defines turning away from your evil way as works. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? So notice here, repentance doesn't always mean turning away from sin, because God does not have sin. So you see how here he's just changing his mind. He's changing what he was going to do to Nineveh because they turned away from their sin. So God turned to repent, turn away from his fierce wrath, fierce anger that we perish not. And look at this. And God saw their works. So God saw what they did different. What did they do? That they turned from their evil way. So they repented of their sins. And what did God say he saw? He saw their works. That he had said, he rep God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So you see, we have to turn from our sins in order to be saved. That is works salvation. Now, in this particular instance, they changed their evil way. God spared the city. But this is not how they obtained eternal salvation, right? Because eternal salvation requires perfection, and then they needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did some of them? Who knows? Maybe. Right? But this is, this is a picture of of salvation, that we need to turn to Jesus. Right? We turn from our evil way by believing on Jesus Christ. Now in Acts 19, we see here that Paul defines what the baptism of repentance is. Because a lot of people will say, well, Jesus and John, they preached repentance of sins. Well, no, they didn't. Because here in Acts 19, Paul defines what John preached when he preached the baptism of repentance. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So you see that very clearly. Baptism of repentance, what is it for salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
Hebrews 6, I touched on this one. The foundation, the doctrine of Christ here is not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So again, dead works is not sin. Dead works is when you are trusting works without faith. So it's an interesting parallel there. Dead works is works without faith. Dead faith is faith without works. A dead faith can save you. Dead works cannot. Right? Now, last one, number seven. Number seven is they'll say something like, you must be willing to follow Jesus. So they may not say we well, have to follow Jesus because that will be you know, keeping the commandments, but they'll just say you just must be willing to follow Jesus. And I already sort of went to Galatians 2. We'll go to Galatians 3. This idea, I sort of touched on it when I was at Ezekiel, but I'll just show you Galatians 3 as well. Galatians 3 is a quote from the Old Testament Deuteronomy law where you have the blessing and the cursing. And this idea of, well, you don't have to actually keep all the commandments, you just have to be willing to keep the commandments. This idea of just a willingness to do it in order to be saved is not what the Bible teaches when it comes to the old covenant and trying to justify yourself by works, which is impossible. So we don't get there by works. But here in Galatians 3 verse 10, look what it says here. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed, look at this, is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So it's not cursed is everyone that is not willing to continue in all things that are written in the book of the law that are trying to do them. It is your curse according to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, if you continue not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. So you see there, we receive that grace by faith. That's how we live. And again, like I, I mentioned this in a couple of sermons ago, I can't remember before, but you know, this whole willingness to do right, it always devolves back into work salvation because they say, well, you don't have to actually do good works, you just have to be willing to do good works. But if you don't do the good works, ah, oh, well, you weren't really willing. All right, so it's just, you know, it just comes back down to, you know, you just have to do good works. When people say willing, willing, well, they're not going to believe that you're willing until you actually do them. All right, so the just shall live by faith. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So just beware of these seven subtle ways of work salvation. You need to do your part, give your life to Jesus. And like I said, these are all good things if they're before, after salvation, just not in order to get salvation. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. You can lose salvation. You must have saving faith. You must repent of your sins to be saved. You must be willing to follow Jesus to be saved. Let's just finish on this last verse. Why is this so important? Why is this such a big deal? Well, because the people that believe work salvation will not be in heaven. That's why it's a big deal. This is why Paul... There is one letter, I don't know if you know this, but Paul is known for writing letters in the New Testament. But do you know he didn't write all these letters? Right? I mean, in the sense that he spoke them and he had people write them down for him. Like he dictated them, right? And people would write down them. Some of the, some of the letters, we know who wrote them down because at the end of the letter it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you. Right? So we can see that other people wrote. But, but Paul... At the end of Galatians, he says, you see how large a letter I've written with my own hand. Why? Because this topic was so important that he penned it himself. And what is Galatians about? It's preaching against work salvation. It's preaching another gospel. He's condemning those who are trying to add works to the gospel. Look what he says in Galatians 1.6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He's saying, saying I, I'm shocked that you've understood grace and yet you want to go back into bondage. You want to go back to trusting your own works or trying to earn your way to heaven. Unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. So he's saying it's another gospel, but it's not the gospel. Right? So it's not like there are different gospels. There's one gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection by which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you which is not another, 
but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And you know what? If you start believing in a work of salvation, it does trouble you. Right? Because you don't know whether you're good enough, you don't know whether God loves you still. It really is debilitating to your Christian life. Once you understand salvation by grace, huge load off your mind. That's why Jesus says, my burden is uh, light. My yoke is easy, my burden light. Because when you serve God knowing that you're saved, you do it out of love. When you serve God because you're scared of going to heaven, it's a big burden because it's a burden you cannot bear. You'll never be perfect. You know, and that's why religions that teach work salvation, like the Buddhists, they're constantly striving to get out, break out of this thing. They're never good enough, right? No matter how holy, how they dress, no hair, no meat, no touching, opposite gender, all the things that they do. But yet, they're still troubled. Why? Because they know deep down in their heart they are sinful. They have sinful thoughts, they have sinful desires, they are rebelling against God in their heart. So, which, which is not another, it's not another gospel, but there'll be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, he's saying, Paul's including himself, even did I, though we or an angel from heaven, so this, this is why Muhammad and Joseph Smith, you know, even another angel from heaven comes, it doesn't matter if it was an angel that went to them. If it's another gospel, this is what the Bible says about it. Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a curse. Now I didn't write this, but we see here Paul who thought it right to pen this own letter with his own hand is giving this stern warning because this is how he feels about work salvation. This is how we ought to feel about work salvation. And this is why it's, it's a terrible thing. You know, people preaching work salvation, believing work salvation, because work salvation will not save them. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So just beware of these types of work salvation. You hear them? Hey, don't pounce on people just because they say these words. Just make sure you understand what they mean by it. But, you know, if people are saying these things, don't be deceived by it. Don't be deceived by, hey, these subtle forms of work salvation. Be solid in knowing Jesus Christ is all it takes to be saved. If you believe on him, he saved you. Sins, past, present, and future. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, Lord. And uh, we thank you that we come to church, we can be reminded. And uh, Lord, as we partake of the bread and the cup, I just pray, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with your love and help us, Lord, to love others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.